So in this part, I want to kind of step back a little bit and uh, take a look at the big picture. Uh, I took a course in uh, World War II at San Diego State University. Go Aztecs. Um, and uh, during that course, um, the instructor or the professor actually was uh, was, was, was an upper, upper division course, History 486. It was a, a course where he emphasized the big picture over and over again. So I'm going to do that a little bit. And when I talk about the big picture, or when my professor talked about the big picture, he started about, oh, 2,500 years ago in a book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Now, Sun Tzu, by the way, is a consortium of folks and ideas kind of collected over time. It's not any one single person. Hi, my name's Sun Tzu, and I wrote this book, The Art of War. You want me to sign it for you? Here you go. Uh, it's not that. Um, you have to think of it more like the Old Testament, right? It's a bunch of books collected over time that were kind of scrapped together. Here's your Bible. The Art of War, here's your Bible if you're a general, uh, or if you're an admiral or something, or if, if you're somebody in charge of war, you're going to want to get Sun Tzu. And by the way, if you are a business major and you have any thoughts of going into the business world, uh, moving into Wall Street or anything, it's mandatory reading. Almost uh, every single business department that I know of assigns this book. It's a, it's a fantastic, deeply insightful uh, book. So if you do get the chance to you know, pick it up and read it, it still sells in Barnes & Noble and stores like that. But it is a compilation of thoughts on the subject of war collected over centuries. Now, some of the interesting things in that book relate particularly to the conflict in World War II. And in that, it states that when you have an enemy, you should be able to understand your enemy better than you understand yourself. Find the enemy's biggest weakness, and that's where you go. Or you find your enemy's biggest strengths, and then you go after that. So it's an interesting book in that sense. We see that thought of in World War II, but then kind of raced around a little bit. Now, there's a more modern representation of the art of war, and it's written by a 19th century Austrian named Karl von Clausewitz. Now, Clausewitz, um, and for you that want to know how to spell it, well, there it is, Karl von Clausewitz. Uh, the USA model of conducting wars is largely based upon this 19th century treaties. Right now, today, in the 21st century, we're trying to shift, and the military is having a very difficult time making that shift to fight the new kind of wars that the world is throwing at us. When we had enemies the size of Japan and Germany in World War II, the von Clausewitz book worked just fine. But our enemy today uh, no longer has, uh, well, a nation state. They have no borders. Uh, they move in and out of countries. Uh, and they don't recognize nation states. They don't recognize borders. They don't wear uniforms. Uh, so it's a different kind of enemy today. And so the work of Karl von Clausewitz isn't as held as in high esteem. But back to World War II. Because this guy is 19th century. He comes, uh, he was a Prussian general. Prussia was the precursor to Germany, so he predates Germany. Germany doesn't become a country until 1871. So if you go far back enough, there's no Germany. There's German-speaking people, but they weren't unified. They didn't have a nation state. They didn't have a state that represented all of Germans. They had a lot of little cities and uh, little regions. Prussia was one of those little regions, and Karl von Clausewitz was a Prussian general, and he fought against Napoleon for more than 20 years years. And Napoleon was a pretty darn good fighter. So after the war, Clausewitz attempts to write down his experiences of 20 plus years of fighting some of the best armies in the world. So Clausewitz cautions that 
whatever he writes should never be used as a guidebook. Why? Because war is too variable. Now, Clausewitz does isolate a couple of key elements, a couple of characteristics about armed conflict. The first thing he, he does, and rather perceptively does, is he poses the question, what is war and what is it supposed to accomplish? And this is the 19th century. And this is the Bible beginning in the night. Sun Tzu is tossed out, people pick up Clausewitz. What is war? What is it supposed to accomplish? Well, according to Clausewitz, war is the extension of politics upon the realm of violence. In other words, war is a tool that governments use when diplomacy fails. So if your political means cannot be obtained by your diplomats, uh, then war is that threat behind the government that will use our soldiers, our navy, or whatever uh, to impose our will upon you. So listen to my diplomats or else, right? So that's one of the things that Clausewitz argues is that in order to take that position, however, you have to have an army almost always at the ready. So again, Clausewitz, war is a tool of the state. In Clausewitz's 19th century time frame, it was, uh, war was a tool that could be employed, and here's the key part, and used safely. It's very important. Clausewitz states that war does not, not cause massive change and calamity. Because uh, we can employ war and use it safely if you follow the guidelines. Always have an army at the ready. Always catch your enemy by surprise. Get in fast. Hit your mark. And then be done with it. And wrap it all up tidy. And no one will ever invade your home space. Now, this is important because Austria, where Clausewitz uh, ended up as a... Um, uh, well, he worked for... Uh, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, who hired him uh, to protect the empire. And Austria is in the middle. It's surrounded on all sides. It barely has a toehold in the ocean uh, down in the Balkans region. But Clausewitz states that if you do it right, if you always have an army at the ready, if you're always unpredictable, and if you always catch the enemy by surprise, you should almost always win, in which case then war will not cause massive damage, will not cause massive change, will not cause massive calamity. It's just a tool, if you use it right. Some historians say, if you think of a blowtorch, if you use it right, it's a safe tool. You use it wrong, kablooey, right? So Clausewitz states that to conduct a, self, a, a, a successful war, the state should eye the other state's, quote, center of gravity. Determine if the enemy state's center of gravity is based upon a leader, a capital city, uh, or its army, or its economic system, or its political system. So if you have a very charismatic leader, in a country nearby, you take him out. You can just assassinate him, right? Then there's no war. He's done. Um, if it's a capital city, uh, you surround it, you lay siege to it, um, you tell them you're going to destroy it unless they sue for peace. Nine times out of ten, they'll sue for peace. This is Clausewitz's thinking. If it's an army, find out where the army is, attack it, and destroy it. And then they have no more means to fight, they sue for peace. Uh, if they have a particular economic system, find out what their strengths and weaknesses are in that economic system, and then you destroy that. He gave an example in his book, if they have terrific coal mines, uh, then what you do is you bar them from mining coal by blowing up all the mine entrances and blowing up all the rail that come in and out, and then 
they can no longer sell coal to the rest of the world, so they can't make any money, they can't supply their armies, and on and on. Or if it's their political system. Sometimes you might have a fledgling republic um, and there's too much distraction within the country. So supply money to people inside the country who will then create a ruckus for you, create a civil war kind of thing, and you don't even have to fight. So this is Clausewitz thinking. So once you determine what a country's center of gravity is, that's what you attack. There's a, another gentleman called Arthur Marwick. And he also has a school of war. Yeah, people study this stuff. You can go to war college, by the way. There, are, there is such a thing. Um, and actually, we have a war college here in the state of California. It's in Monterey. Uh, you have to be in like the Army or the Navy or the Air Force or something, the Marine Corps, to go. Uh, but there is a war college there. And by the way, um, it's not generals or lieutenant commanders or commanders that teach at the war college. It's civilian professors that go to war college to teach our military officers how to conduct war. Anyway, they would teach Arthur Marwick. And Marwick departs from Clausewitz in that he s states, um, Clausewitz an idiot, because war definitely does cause change. War changes participants. War is a transforming event. And I think we're going to see that when we take a look at the United States. War did change the United States participants. The people in this country, the people who never left the country, but still were part of the war machine, producing war materials, being asked to ration, being asked to plant victory gardens, being asked to be part of the process that helps us supply the troops and the sailors around the world. War was definitely a transforming event during World War II. So according to Marwick, there were two types of change. There's disruptive change and destructive change. So an example of a disruptive change might be like a farm kid from Iowa and in a couple of months he's no longer on the farm but he's facing down Germans in the woods of Alsace, right? Um, or a housewife is riveting B-17 wings um, in just a couple of months before she was a mother of two baking pies, right? So this is kind of a disruptive process. Also, the um, another disruptive process might be the other way. So, for example, what Marwick says is you had the Krupp plant. Uh, Krupp makes coffee makers now, but back in World War One, they were making howitzers and big, huge things to kill people. Um, and the Krupp plant never, ever, 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 Krupp's uh, headquartered in Germany, by the way, ever, ever, ever employed women until 1916 when they hired 12,000 of them. And this created a disruptive social change in Germany because post-war, uh, women started to stand up for themselves and their rights and demand more in society. A very similar process in the United States in World War II where uh, millions of women went to work. Then once the war is over, the soldiers are coming home, women are being advertised to go back into the kitchen. We'll see that when we get to the 50s. Anyway, war also, according to Marwick, has a uh, testing dimension. It can test a person, such as what do you do when you're faced with German 88s as you try to storm the beach at Normandy? War has a testing dimension on a much larger scale, too, particularly the Second World War. War will test all sorts of things. War is going to test not just individual resolve, but it's going to test your country's political system. It's going to it's going to test your country's economic system. The last time Britain had lost a war prior to the beginning of the Second World War was in 1812. So 1815, they signed a peace with the United States. It was really a draw. They didn't win, but they did, you know, but they, they kind of lost. Right? 
Um, but Britain was on the winning side in the rest of the wars. Britain won in the Crimean War, the Boer War, it won in World War One. It was on the winning side in World War One, I, I should say. It was on the winning side in World War Two. Yet, if you look at at Britain today, Britain is no longer anywhere near the hegemon or superpower that Britain was when Britain defeated Napoleon in 1815. Right? And it's a shell of what it used to be, but it never lost a war from that time after defeating Napoleon and losing in the War of 1812. It hadn't lost a war. It still hasn't. But yet it's not a superpower like it used to be. You see, so there's this testing dimension to war. It's going to keep testing you. You might survive. You might get a D <laughs> or a C um, after the test, but you're not going to be that superpower. So you have to be careful with war, I guess, is the story. Um, in 1914, uh, just kind of throwing this out there, um, war, will, war will also test the, um, the domestic culture within your country. So, for example, Britain and both Britain and the United States are countries that pride themselves on certain civil liberties. Uh, you look at our First Amendment, uh, we have the freedom of speech, for example. Well, during wartime, that's often suspended. So, uh, Britain had this thing in, in the Defense of the Realm Act in 1914 and civil liberties were suspended with the Defense of the Realm Act. They suspended them because they didn't want anybody to make any trouble. They needed to make war materials and they needed everybody to go to work and, and if they weren't working, go to the front lines and no strikes. So they passed the Defense of the Realm Act in 1914. The United States did the same thing. We passed the Sedition Acts. And during World War II, we passed the internment acts and began to collect Japanese citizens and began to jail Japanese citizens almost at will. Even though some of those Japanese had been born in the United States and might have even been third generation or fourth generation and didn't speak a word of Japanese. Interesting. Marwick says one more thing. War has a participation dimension. Everyone is needed in, in, in war, in the concept of total war. So groups that were marginalized in the beginning are now going to be asked to join the war effort. So, for example, the blacks that were marginalized from the Civil War all the way through the 1930s are now going to be asked to participate in the war effort. In return, blacks are going to say, um, not without some more civil rights. We don't want to be lynched anymore. Thank you very much. And we're tired of not being hired. We're the last one hired, the first one fired, all those sorts of things. And we had the Broceres program as well. People that were living on the margins of society. Uh, Mex uh, Mexican Americans or Hispanic Americans are now being asked to help in the war effort. Native Americans, who have always been on the fringe of American society, are now welcome with open arms. Um, Ira Hayes is a song by Johnny Cash that celebrates uh, a Native American who went and fought and was one of the participants who raised the flag on Iwo Jima. And so when you listen to the Johnny Cash song, Ira Hayes, think about what Johnny is singing about and how tough it was for uh, this Native American, Mr. Hayes, to come back to the United States and adjust to, to living in time. So there's this huge psychological dimension to war as well. And it has to do with uh, the threat of heightened hostilities. World War II, the thing to remember, I think for me, is that so much change occurred in a remarkably short period of time. 
And when you read about this in the chapter, keep this in mind, it's like a switch. Change was that fast. There are some themes that I want to talk about. The war started out small in a number of ways. Now, we don't tend to think of World War II as a small war, and it's not. It's huge, but it started out very piecemeal. A little battle here, a little battle there, just kind of starting to flare up. We don't get involved like like World War I until there's already been a couple of years of fighting going on. So let's take a look at that. Uh, in 1939, for example, there existed only four participants, and the United States was not one of them. We don't join until December of 1941. So in January of 39, we still got like almost three years more for the United States to kind of join in. And there existed four participants in January of 1939. There was Germany, Great Britain, Poland, and France. Now, Poland and France fell so quickly that by 1940, really, only Germany and Great Britain were involved in the conflict. Now, you add the Soviet Union in 1941, you add the United States, North Africa, the Balkans, the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, so, but geographically, it started small, and it turned into this global thing. And also, the amount or the number of men that were needed in the early part of the war was really uh, astonishingly small. Uh, so an example of that would be the Battle of Britain. That was an aviation campaign fought by less than what would fill San Diego's Cox Arena for a basketball game. Less than about 28,000 people fought in the Battle of Britain. It's really amazingly small when you think about it. Uh, and that's counting both sides. Okay. I mean, the Battle of Britain was supposed to be a gentleman's war, you know, um, on the Western Front. But it becomes a, uh, a, a brutal war pretty soon. And the war becomes amazingly brutal, particularly on the Eastern Front. A, a brutal war of massive proportions. Um, and Britain is lucky. It has this huge navy. Um, it always has. Uh, it's an island. It's difficult to get to. There was no channel back then. There's no bridge. There still isn't. So uh, getting to Britain was never really seriously contemplated by the upper brass of the German army command, despite what Hitler wanted. Okay. Britain has, a, has an advantage because it's an island. It's interesting that the United States and Japan have this huge distance between the two. 6,000 miles separates Tokyo from San Francisco. And they're going to have a hard time fighting one another. Japan, in 1941, when they bombed Pearl Harbor, had about one-tenth the economy of the United States. And now we go all the way back to Sun Tzu, all the way back to Clausewitz. If you're going to attack the enemy, in your Japan, you're going to look at how do I defeat the economy of the United States. And it wasn't the economy that was targeted, was it? What the J Japanese attacked was the other item that uh, Clausewitz says you should attack, which is its military capabilities, in which case it was the United States Navy. If they could sink the U.S. Navy, particularly its aircraft carriers, then the ability to conduct war against the United States will allow the Japanese to buy some time in order to capture some very important oil fields to keep their war machine rolling. So even though Japan had one-tenth the economy of the United States, how do you attack an economy that's based on capitalism? And that was one of the problems that Japan had. It opted instead to attack uh, the military uh, fleet in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. 
One of the questions that's raised by historians is the role of leadership. So France fell, and France fell quickly. It's not like World War I. France held on in World War I. They suffered enormous losses, um, but they were not ready for the fight when Hitler's tanks came rolling through. They just caved, and they caved quickly. But historians wonder, is it because they were militarily inferior, or did France fall because of a lack of leadership? So then they point to Britain. Did Britain succeed in the Battle of Britain because you had a great leader, Churchill, or did Britain succeed in the Battle of Britain because of the military uh, superiority in air fighters against the bombers from Germany, which were only mid-level bombers. They didn't have any long-range bombers. One of the last things I want to talk about is intelligence, because it's a huge leading factor in the Allied victory. One of the things that got broke uh, about midway through the war was the German Enigma Code, Ultra. Um, excuse me, the German Enigma Code was cracked by a British team called Ultra. And once we were able to crack that code, we could use that code to send messages on their <laughs> uh, secure system that would confuse them, uh, which we used on June 6, 1944, which was D-Day. We sent out much, much misinformation to the Germans that were defending France. They didn't know exactly where we were going to land until it was too late. Another great example of intelligence uh, gathering was our ability to break the Japanese code. Now, we knew that the Japanese were planning an attack somewhere after Pearl Harbor, but we didn't know exactly where. And we had three targets that we thought that the Japanese would attack. And so what the United States military or Navy intelligence did was to pretend that a water tanker was broken and needed parts. And, and then sent out a purposely leaked message. Our water tank is broken. We need these many parts. Can someone deliver them to Midway Island? Sure enough, about a day later, the Japanese send some messages that our target, Midway, they're having problems with water. This should be a, a cakewalk. So now we knew that the Japanese were going to invade the island of Midway. We just didn't know from what direction. But what we did is we moved the Yorktown and other Navy ships or aircraft carriers in the neighborhood. We launched observation planes and we spotted them coming in from the northwest. We alerted our aircraft carrier units. They were able to launch uh, fighters and dive bombers and torpedo planes and they flew at as high as they possibly could fly, which is about 25,000 feet. That's pushing it. But what they did is they watched the Japanese come in and bomb Midway. A lot of people say, well, why did we let them do that? Well, Midway is not going to sink. It's an island, right? So it's, it's still going to be there. Um, so once the Japanese came in their first wave, we then watched the planes go back. And once those planes landed on the deck to refuel, to put new ordnance under the wings, that's when we dropped from 25,000 feet and immediately sank five of their aircraft carriers in the Battle of Midway. It was intelligence that got us there at that point. Okay? What else do we have? All right, ladies and gentlemen, and another switch that I kind of want to make is to talk about a book by a historian called Richard Overy. And this book uh, actually poses its own inquiry from the historical inquiry process. It's called Why the Allies Won the War. So if you're wondering, why did the Allies win the war? Well, why not put it in a title of a book, right? So. Interestingly, 
Overy states that the Second World War has been couched in such a way as to be misleading. It was couched in terms of politics, democracies allied against fascism. And Overy says that this is largely a mistake. What we should be looking at, instead of, instead of this blended mix uh, of, of, of politics, is to look more closely at culture and economics. The fight is not between whether one country is democratic or whether another is fascist. No. The fight, according to Overy, is between societies that are industrial versus those societies that are militaristic. It's where Madison Avenue free economics bumps into beliefs embedded in the ancient military heroic traditions. So Overy takes a look at the military societies of both Japan and Germany and finds at least two major traits in common. In Japan, there is the Bushido Code. And in Germany, there's a society steeped in gender heroics, the male-dominated society steeped in what the Italians called machismo. So here we have both Germany and Japan, very gender-specific, male-dominated societies uh, where heroism is, uh, is, is bravoed and failure is looked down upon. In both Germany and Japan, there is also a strong element of aristocratic ties. So in Germany, for example, on the face of it, this would pe appear incorrect, right? We have Adolf Hitler, who was born of a postal employee. Um, but if you look closely, the German high command is a riddled who's who of that country's nobility. Uh, this is true in Japan as well. But because of machismo and, and because of the Bushido code, there's this cultural desire to be heroic, to be in battles, to be on the front lines with your troops. And this, this desire to do that is enormously strong. This has some huge effects, says Overy, because within the fir first year, or if not the the first two years of the war, both Germany and Japan will lose a significant number of its best and brightest minds. The ones most educated to deal with the realities of the war, with the planning and the logistics of total war, they are themselves casualties within that very war. In America, this is not the case. The best and brightest those with the Harvard degrees, the Yale diplomas, they take positions within the government that oversee the planning and logistics of the total war concept. And for those that feel the strong need of joining the military, well, they enter in as generals or a very high tier officer. And in the United States, there is a long standing military tradition of placing our generals well back from the front lines <laughs> where the danger is extremely minimized. So thus, after the first year of the war, the United States High Command is generally intact. Its best and its brightest are solving problems concerned with war production materials and the economic abilities to construct war materials and deliver the war materials to the front lines. And then once at the front lines, again, our best and brightest are dictating some of the most awesome battle tactics ever against a militarized enemy. And Overy also uses the case of one of the most famous aircraft of the war, the German fighter plane called the Messerschmitt. Now, Richard Overy points out that because of the machismo culture, nearly all of the aristocracy that volunteered to be in charge of the various air wings in the German Luftwaffe, well, they possess some sort of heroic or personal need to personalize their aircraft. So, for example, uh, one commander may be a bit daring and develops a style for his squadron that they fly low to the ground. So he's going to demand, uh, based on his style, his machismo, uh, 
um, that the manufacturer of the aircraft, that they put on heavy armor on the bottom to protect from gunfire from the enemy below. Well, there might be this other air commander that doesn't like to do the low flying things, thinks it might be base, and based on his machismo um, and his heroic style, he wants to scream out of the sky, high, huge, steep dives and strafe. Now, so for this commander, he needs a different kind of aircraft. Agility will be the key. So not only does he not want the extra armor, but he orders the typical plated armor of the Messerschmitt to be replaced with lighter material. So here with just two commanders, we already have three different versions of the Messerschmitt aircraft. In fact, during the course of the war, there will be as many as 42 different versions of the most successful German fighter, the Messerschmitt. And not because of battlefield needs or tactics, but based solely upon the whims and desires of the aristocracy in charge of the various air commands in the German Luftwaffe. Now this is going to cause, according to Overy, serious delays in wartime productions. Because different planes means you need different parts, different fittings. And different fittings often call for different designs, and in aircraft production you just can't throw a switch and suddenly you have a new version streaming out the factory doors. You need different parts, different screws, different machinery to make those parts. And Overy suggests that it took at a minimum up to three days or a maximum of three weeks for a factory to stop production on one aircraft and begin production on another. Overy compares this to, uh, or the story of the Messerschmitt, to another fighter aircraft. In fact, um, there were more of these fighters produced during the course of the war than all the rest of the fighters of the world combined. That's how many were made. This is the Soviet IL-2, or the Ilyushin Tank Buster. Now, whereas the Germans had 42 different versions of the Messerschmitt, there was only one version of the Ilyushin produced during the entire war. Never was there a design change, never was there a factory slowdown, never was there a halt in production. Yes, the Ilyushin tank buster had its flaws, and Russian commanders often cursed the fighter's limitations, but what the Ilyushin lost in military efficiency, it was easily made up in just sheer numbers. So for the Russians, it was quantity. And for Overy, the real point comes down to this, that the Russians had outproduced their German counterparts by more than two to one in war materials, which may not seem like a lot, but so too did the United States, and almost the same numbers from Canada and British factories combined. Thus, in the European campaign, Germany's enemies outproduced the German war machine by a factor of five. Overy points out that the least successful element for the Allies in the Second World War was its strategy. Now, as mentioned before, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz argued that you needed to attack the enemy based upon one of its five weaknesses or strengths. And the best way to defeat a society is, to, is a militaristic society. Well, is to take out its military. Uh, and in the case of Germany, you take the fight to wherever the German army is. Uh, in the case of Japan, it's a, it's a little different because of geography. The tactics dictated that you take out the capital and its military command, which was headquartered in Tokyo. In both cases, Germany and Japan, neither of these were done. It was the Russians who took on the brunt of the Nazi army, whose invasion began in June of 1941, and they will not the Russians will not get any help from the Allies until June of 1944, when the Allies finally land on the beaches of Normandy, opening a second front on the continent of Europe. So it took three years for the Allies to finally take the fight to the enemy, Germany, in Europe. In the Pacific theater, once again, rather than taking the fight straight to the enemy, attacking the mainland of Japan, uh, attempt to take out the capital, attempt to take out its leaders, the Allies instead chose to 
island hop their way to Japan, and we never did during the course of the war land any troops whatsoever on the Japanese main islands. Again, said Overy, this choice was costly, long, and, pro and protracted, a process that took more than three years and only culminated and ended because of two atomic bombs. In the end, however, industrial societies beat out the militaristic ones. Perhaps that's the irony of all ironies, eh? So, if we switch gears now toward a vision of the post-war world, the best time to plan for that is actually during the war. But oddly enough, the United States' vision for a post-war world actually began began before the USA ever joined in the war. In August of 1941, Winston Churchill of the UK met with the US President Franklin D. Roosevelt on a ship off of Newfoundland. So here the two leaders laid the traces of what a post-war world would look like. And after an Allied victory, of course, so, as your textbook points out, the Atlantic Charter of 1941 was largely built on the moral-slash-political rhetoric that we will promise to destroy fascism everywhere, and we will elevate and give you the gift of democracy for all the world, of course, except for those people already colonized by European powers. I think the more interesting meeting that took place was in June and July of 1944 at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Now today, historians call the results of what occurred at this small ski town and resort the, the Bretton Woods regime. Whereas the Atlantic Charter espoused moral and somewhat convoluted political overtones, the results emanating from Bretton Woods was largely economic attempting to configure a more stable world theater in which commerce and free trade could flow. Now, I'll argue, the day I die, that all of the occurrence, of all the occurrences of the Second World War, the one with the longest lasting and most significant impact upon my life and your life has to do with what came out of Bretton Woods. And we get three organizations out of this 1944 July conference in New Hampshire. Now, the first of this or these organizations is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Now, the purpose of the IMF was to stabilize world currencies, to tie all currency to a single gold standard, and to prevent runs or dumps on any one nation's money. For multinational corporations that are trying to expand around the world, the IMF made life a whole lot easier. It's the predictability of currency valuation that allowed corporations to globalize. Multinational corporations are created and largely blossom after the Second World War due to the creation of the IMF. Now, the second organization that the Bretton Woods regime created was called GATT, G-A-T-T, -T, or commonly known as the Guarantee on Tariffs and Trade. Now this organization attempted to negotiate and enforce tariff values between nations to keep tariff rates low so that commerce can flow transnational, beyond borders, freely. Now GATT later changed its name to also reflect its current duties. It changed its name to the World Bank. Today the World Bank not only acts to ensure that tariffs remain low and goods flow freely, but the World Bank also lends money to help develop infrastructure projects to facilitate that trade, uh, mainly port facilities for shipping, but also airports, highways, electric generation plants, and oil fields, and so on. Last, the United States insisted upon a world body to oversee a more stable political post-war world. Thus, the United States was the one that created the United Nations. The United Nations established 
spheres of influence. And to this day, there are only five major powers uh, with permanent seats on the Security Council, any one of which can and often possess their veto power. Even if all countries in the General Assembly vote unanimously, just one of any of these five can veto legislation and the General Assembly bill is null and void. Now those five countries, by the way, are the United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom. More important are the nations that are not on this list, certainly not Germany or Japan, which were defeated in the Second World War, but no one single country south of the equator, not Brazil and not India. And China was a reach in 1944 and 1945. They had been utterly destroyed and demolished by the Japanese, and they were in the midst of fighting an internal civil war that had been going on already for a decade. And it would be a decision that would haunt future world leaders as China turned communist in 1949, and they are only coming out of that shell today. No longer would the United States remain isolationist. After the war, the United States would embrace a movement to continually expand its sphere of influence on a global scale. Whereas the Monroe Doctrine once stated to the world that the United States would take care of the Western Hemisphere, the results of Bretton Woods stated that the United States would seek to majorly influence the world itself. The United States had emerged from the war a global power, and it would shape that world in its own image, one based upon a loose definition of freedom, democracy, and commerce. One of the greatest lasting legacies of social engineering, one of the last bills signed into law by President Roosevelt before he died was the GI Bill. Millions of returning war veterans took up Uncle Sam's offer to go to college for free. Millions of sailors, Marines, former Army personnel, perhaps even those workers uh, who could not find work during the Great Depression but were veterans, suddenly, with a bit of studying, found themselves with degrees and entered the post-war world workforce better educated and thus better paid than ever before. There was so much money floating around in the late 1950s, the explosion of suburbia began, new houses, new cars uh, to get to the house, new furniture to put into the house, new lawnmowers to mow the lawn in front of the house, new appliances, new everything, new, 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 new. Think about it. When Kennedy said this in 1961, that we will put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, he knew that NASA was staffed with a bunch of ex-GIs, war-tested, smart, some of them aerospace engineers, electric engineers, scientists and physicists, who could not only take up the challenge, but who could get the job done. The world will not be the same since the Second World War. The United States will not be the same since the Second World War. We'll catch you next time.